And I just want to invite everyone listening and watching this conversation between me and Howard Martin from Heart Math Institute, whom I warmly welcome to the Conscious Evolution Summit. And I want to invite everyone just to take a moment to really become present, to feel your body, to become aware of your breathing, become aware of this, the room you are in or the car or maybe you are outside. Just become aware of where you are and maybe also just have this intention to connect to the large field of the summit and of consciousness itself which our conversations are dedicated to. Many, many people are joining this field, this interest, their wish to evolve, to become more aware and to be able to direct awareness, especially more towards the heart And again, welcome you, Howard Martin, to our conversation. Well, thank you very much for having me and, and, you know, making me a part of your summit. You know, these are important times that we live in today. And I think connecting in all the ways that we can to discuss important subjects is a good thing for us to do. So I want to welcome everyone who's listening to our conversation, uh, wherever you are around the world and whatever, whenever it is that you happen to be listening. And let you know that um, I hope that you gain something from our discussion today that's going to help um, provide some more meaningfulness and fulfillment you know, to your life. Mm, thank you very much. And I mean, becoming more aware of our heart, of our heart space, of the intelligence of the heart, I guess this is really something very crucial and I especially invited you as an expert in this field and I'm very curious maybe to start uh, in the first place, what brought you to dedicate your time, your life to this topic? Oh, wow, it's a long story, isn't it? <laughs> Going back a long time ago. Well, as a very young man, I was fortunate um, in that I was uh, in a time period when young people were beginning to explore, you know, it was in the, in the late sixties, early seventies, we were, you know, there was a, a movement, so to speak, of people, you know, going into self exploration processes. And, uh, you know, I read the books, I practiced techniques, I did the things people would do, but they all led back to the same place, which was really about my heart and about whether I was going to, you know, actualize what I knew or not. Uh, along the way, I met Doc Childry, who's the man who's the founder of HeartMath, and he became my friend. Um, he was just a little bit older than I am, but I could f tell pretty quickly that he had an awareness that would embraced mine. And he became my friend, and he talked about heart in ways that was kind of different. He didn't talk about it just in philosophical ways or in, in uh, sentimental ways. He talked about it as an intelligence, uh, provided a guiding principle in our lives. If you got us, if you're making the choices we need to make big or small. And so this was early in my life and I realized a couple of things. I realized that my life needed to be about growth, that whatever I did, it, it had to be about whether I was growing, whether my consciousness awareness was growing, whether I was becoming a better man, uh, whether I was manifesting more of the qualities of the heart, like love, care, kindness, and compassion. But that was what needed to be most important. The external things that I did, whatever job I had or where I lived or who I became you know, married to, were important as well, but not as important as continuous growth. Uh, in the process, I also realized that you know, continuous growth needed to lead to service to others. That if you gain something, you needed to share it. It didn't need to be shared from uh, ego or hubris 
it needed to be shared sincerely, but it needed to be shared. So my life started to be guided by those two principles, continuous growth and service to others. And now that went on for a very long time. I had different careers, I lived in a different place. Um, you know, it was a, a different life. And uh, Doc Childry, myself and others, uh, never had an ambition in those days to start any kind of an organization. Mm. We were just bonding as friends and supporting one another and staying in close contact and working together to learn and grow and to, uh, to change as people. And we did that in obscurity in Eastern North Carolina in the United States in the South. You know, there wasn't a lot going on around us, you know, that, that supported that kind of, of activity, but we, we just went for it ourselves. And we, we ended up, I would say, in what we call uncharted water. Yeah, we had gained a lot from what we'd learned and what we read, but we started moving into a place where we were sort of creating our own way and all of that. And we did that for 15 years before we ever had heart math. Right. A long time. Uh, it was, over time, it became you know, obvious that we needed to structure what we'd been learning, put it into a context that could be shared in the name of service with others. Doc could easily see that the stressors in the world were increasing and were going to continue to increase. We wanted to make a contribution to helping people um, benefit and, and manage themselves through the changing times that were already happening and we're going to be uh, you know, more of that coming. Mm -hmm. So after a long time, we eventually formed HeartMath. Uh, we did it with other people that we knew in California. We moved to California. We started with literally nothing but our vision and our intent and our desire. We didn't have a big business plan. We didn't have outside capital and all of that. We started, you know, simple and we built it from the ground up. And today, you know, we've been doing this now for 28 years. Mm -hmm. We have a huge footprint all around the world. We've touched the lives of millions of people in meaningful ways. We operate in multiple markets. We have sold our products and services in over 120 countries. <laughs> uh, it's become a big little organization. And for me, uh, being an executive of HeartMath and an author of HeartMath books and all of that, that's been really fun. But it still comes back to the guiding principle. Am I getting, am I improving day to day? Am I becoming a better Howard Martin than the one the day before? You know. Am I doing uh, things that are of service to others? These are still guiding principles for me. So the forms have taken different shapes along the way, but the intent and the desire is still the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are the programs which are now, in your opinion, the most relevant you share? Well, you know, all of our programs are designed to get people in touch with their heart's intelligence. <laughs> You know, and we do it in, a, in kind of a wide spectrum, to be honest with you. Um, because heart math is science-based, which is just one of the most important aspects of who we are, is that we are able to transition into very mainstream applications with what we've done. So my audience, for example, would be people um, probably more interested in personal and spiritual growth. Uh, that's who I seem to attract, and that's I speak to those subjects and uh, do it, you know, all around the world. And there's, that's sort of my audience, but there are many other audiences associated with heart math. For example, we train, we do training programs on building resilience. That would be the, you know, the, the goal in large organizations, uh, healthcare institutions, uh, corporations, uh, government agencies, the military, um, police departments, you know, very mainstream organizations. And they're learning about the qualities of the heart and about accessing their heart intelligence, but the context is different. You know, the language is different. You know, in my, my programs, I may talk about spirit merging with humanness. Uh, in a police department, we talk about operational efficiency. You know? uh, so there's different terminology that we're really sort of structuring so people get what they need for you know, where they are in life and for what they do. So we're also, a way in which we've expanded is through certifying others. Hmm. Rather than doing all the training ourselves, we have about 8,000 certified people around the world. And they are certified coaches or certified trainers or certified health professionals. Hmm. And we have programs for them. And that's how we've been able to, you know, sort of replicate and expand ourselves because we're, we're not a giant organization. We can't take care of the world without help. So part of our training model today is certifying people. 
And we're moving now more into general consumer training, a lot of online training, things we're developing now that will be released uh, next year. Uh, to reach more and more people, masses of people, with um, a new understanding about themselves and about how to, how to navigate life. So there's still an expansion going on here. Uh, the HeartMass system is tools, techniques, methods, and technology, and it's all underpinned with scientific research. So we spend a lot of our time uh, trying to figure out creative, effective, business-like ways in which we can share that with more people. Hmm. And what are your practical techniques or, or practices, what you apply on yourself to really bring awareness to your heart? Well, yeah, I mean, within the heart mass system, there's a suite of techniques for various applications, but at the essence of those techniques is a very simple process that I just repeat over and over again all day long in various ways. And it's to focus the attention in the area right here in, in the area of my heart. And that draws the energy right here to, to, to the heart, physical heart itself. And then there's a practice that we have called heart-focused breathing. And in heart-focused breathing, uh, it's similar to other breathing techniques. It's a little different, uh, but you just breathe naturally and normally, but deep, deeper than you normally would. And as you breathe, you imagine as if your breath is coming in and out through that area, right through the heart area. Now, a lot goes on in your body when you do a breathing technique like that. They've been used for thousands of years and they are effective. We take it uh, another step and it's to uh, activate a regenerative uplifting emotion. The emotions associated with the term heart. So as you're doing your heart focused breathing, you can try to feel, let's say appreciation for the good things in life. You know, uh, you mentioned before we went on the air that you had just come back from picking blueberries. Well, you can feel the feeling you had as you're out there picking those blueberries, you know, and appreciate that feeling. Or for some people, you know, it may be that they can feel a feeling of um, the love or care that they have for someone or something in their life. It could be a person, it could be a place, it could be a pet. Uh, it can be a feeling of just well-being, like, hey, you know, life has its ups and downs, but it's not so bad. You know, things are okay. Whatever that feeling is, you feel that feeling as you do your heart-focused breathing. As you do that, a lot happens inside the body, physiologically. It's really good for our health. It's uh, bringing about synchronization in the nervous system. It's creating the release of hormones into our body that are regenerative, like more DHEA and more oxytocin. Uh, the heart is sending signals to the brain and the rest of the body. That's part of our research. Well, those signals become more ordered and coherent and they go into the brain and begin to open up the higher brain centers. So we become smarter, we become more aware, we become more perceptive. And all that happens when you just slow down enough to focus your attention here, do some heart focused breathing and then casually activate a uplifting feeling. Now there's techniques going into things like how do you use that to make decisions? How do you use that to regulate emotions? How do you use that to communicate? How do you use that to plan? You know, this is the suite of the skill sets that we have within what we teach in our training programs. But at the core of that, it's, it's going to be heart focus and heart focus breathing and the activation of a heart feeling. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what would you recommend as a time to start? I mean, I guess the, the more often the better, but I mean, in your experience, yeah. I guess every minute you practice it makes already a difference. Yeah, but it's especially important to start right at the beginning of the day. You know, for many people, me included, the beginning of the day is when you wake up and, and you're starting to orient yourself towards your activities. And, and that's when a lot of the old stuff can come up. The old processors, you know, the complaints or the, the down, down views about things, even about people or about life or about situations. And they can show up a bit more in the morning. And so I try to manage that and say, well, no, come on, you know, you don't want to start your day there, you know. And so I don't, you know, as soon as I, my eyes begin to open, I try to at least focus in the area of my heart, you know. Then once I get up and I go through the normal process of showering and dressing and all of that, I spend 15 to 20 minutes every morning doing a heart focused meditation. It's like the, like the technique I share, but it's also radiational. I radiate it out. And I radiate it out into various uh, situations. Some of it can be radiating it to me. <laughs> uh, some of it can be to, let's say, a world situation, a global situation. It could be towards a, a business outcome. 
you know, but it just has to be hard focused. And so I spend 15 or 20 minutes doing that. And I use our technology, it's called the inner balance trainer. It measures the quality of communication between heart, brain, and body. It measures a state called coherence. You don't have to use that, I do, because it keeps me honest. <laughs> it lets me know when I'm drifting off and you know, processing a business meeting versus really putting some heart out towards, uh, towards the world. And that's the way I start my day. Then during the day, there's always times where you can just, you know, whether your eyes are open or eyes are closed, it doesn't really matter. You know, driving in your car, uh, walking uh, to your office, uh, walking from your office to the meeting room. I mean, there's all kinds of places that you can practice that. And so I just try to bring that focus back there. And a lot of times I'll ask myself questions, you know, as I'm walking to the meeting room, like, what are you really feeling right now? You know, um, are there, is there anything that you're feeling right now that you'd kind of like to shift? You know, maybe I'm feeling uh, some subtle anxiousness about the meeting, you know, uh, because I'm, and it might be because I don't think it's going to go the way I want it to. You know? So I have to adjust that and go, well, wait a minute, maybe the way you want it to go is not the best way, right? You know, so go in there with like a neutral attitude at least, you know, and save yourself from uh, the anxiousness about all that. So there's, Lots of moments like that during the course of any given day that I apply activating my heart's intelligence. And then in the evening sometime, uh, I also find time for some you know, quiet time and some good old heart focus, mm -hmm. just to make sure that that connection is in, in my day is, is going to have that in the latter part of the day as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of framing my day, first thing in the morning, later in the day, you know, in the evening, but also during the day, just trying to stay in that place. Mm. It doesn't, it's not like I'm walking around all the time, like focusing and struggling, like I'm have a book on my head. There's a flow to this whole thing, you know, where you sort of flow through life with a connection to your heart's intelligence. And mm. so you can become that with practice. And the structures of the techniques, they are important and they help over time you just begin to live more that way and it becomes more natural to you. Mm. And then you touch base with it uh, as you go through the various activities, because we all get busy. We all have challenges. We all get news. We don't like, we all get the emails that upset us or the phone calls and it's just returning, you know, as soon as we can back to that place um, and allowing for life to be life and for us to be um, living in a human experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also, I just simply, it's a habit I, I developed that when I go to bed, I just put my hands on my body, on the heart, and I fell asleep like that. So it's, it's a, a little gesture, but it makes a difference also. Uh, sure I does. I'm sure it does. That's a good thing to do. Yeah. And uh, what are some topics or areas you you are doing right now some more research in mm -hmm. yeah well, we've we've moved our research from the personal to the social yeah we uh, have become world leaders in understanding with heart brain heart brain body communication and the state of coherence which is this highly ordered state physiologically and psychologically uh, that has a lot to do with our health our performance and our awareness and so for years we've been you know leaders in the world in that and have, have contributed i think a lot to other people's understanding of those type of subjects yeah. as an example um, i was asked in an interview a few years ago where heart mass greatest contribution uh, had been to the world so far and i didn't have a, a regular answer for that but what came out was is we've validated other people's belief systems mm. meaning our science and our understanding people draw from that and I know you're based in Germany and about two years ago, um, and this happens at other places, but because you're Germany, I remember the, the event, I was speaking at an emotional intelligence conference in Frankfurt and there were about, you know, nine or 10 other speakers, most of them European. And I went into the green room where all the speakers were. And when I went in there, most all of them came up to me and said, thank you. I wouldn't be able to do my work today if it wasn't for you and for heart math. You gave this credibility. You made it easy for me to be able to share this. You made it real. You made it relevant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what heart math gave me 
and they might be doing something that was related but very different than us, but they were drawing from our work, right? So we've been doing that for 28 years. We have that down. Now, where have we been going now? It's into what we call social coherence. Hmm. How do we work together? How do we learn to cooperate more? We know that the, the energetic model is moving from competition to cooperation, but how do you do that? And how do you measure it? How do you understand it? How do you get it to work even better? So social coherence is our focus today. And we're coming out with new technology and new training programs next year that focus on social coherence. And that can be within a group, it can be within a team, it can be within a family, it can be within a country. You know, it can be with, between countries. You know, how do we engender more of this? And there's a great scientific understanding that we're uncovering about how that happens in very measurable states that we can see when teams and organizations and groups are working together harmoniously. And then the training programs are designed to facilitate that. So we got measurement on one side, we have techniques and understanding to facilitate it on the other. So we're moving into social coherence. Uh, ultimately, um, it's about global coherence, and we have the global coherence initiative as part of what we do, but we, all, we take it in steps. You're not going to get the social coherence without personal coherence, mm. and you're not going to get the global coherence without more social coherence. So we build it in steps, and we, we build out our mission, so to speak, in ways that ultimately leads to uh, a whole lot more hard intelligence being applied in practical ways on a global scale. And can you already share a bit how you can measure that in, in groups? And Yeah, one of the ways in which we measure is we look at something called heart rate variability. And that is a measurement of the timing that takes place between heartbeats. Like a fitness monitor just measures heart rate, how fast and slow is it going? Well, Heart rate variability analysis is measuring how is the rhythm moving, you know, as it speeds up and slows down. Now, this measurement is important. It, uh, it, it shows you uh, synchronization happening in a very important part of our nervous system called the autonomic nervous system, which influences about 90% of our body's functions. It's also a, a reflection of our emotional state. Uh, as we change emotions, our heart rhythms change. If we're feeling a little frustrated or angry, for example, they will be very jagged and irregular, speeding up and slowing down really quickly, and the rhythm is jerky. You know, If we're feeling more loving, more caring, more appreciative, those rhythms become more smooth and ordered. If you see it on a graph, it's like a sine wave. It's hard to speeding down and slowing up in this beautiful sort of wave, you know? and you can see that. There are implications on how that impacts brain function. There are implications on how that impacts health. So we know how to measure individual coherence. That's what our technology does. You can buy an inner balance trainer, you know, and you can learn to see your own heart rhythms and you can learn to become more coherent by using it. It's what I use. Now we're developing ways in which we can see that happening in multiple people at the same time within groups to where you can measure the heart rate variability collectively in a group, see what the group is actually doing and we're moving that towards being able to do that in real time. Like we could be doing, we'll have technology not too far from now where, where let's say a team in a company is in a meeting and you could measure what's happening collectively in that meeting in real time as the meeting's going on. And would, so, it, would it look like that every person would, would have such a, a measurement? You'd be able to see the individuals and you'd be able to see the collective. You know, the, you know the, the, the collective of all that, what's the total coherence output of that group and what individuals are in what place, you know, uh, within it. So you get both, both sides of the measurement. So we'll be able to look at this synchronization that's happening between people. You see, a lot of our research now is focusing on another term I use, but it relates to social coherence. It's called energetic connectivity. And what that means is that we, all living systems on this planet and beyond are connected through a vast web of energetic connections. Um, all of that's becoming more uh, real through modern science, our science and other people's science. To understand that there's an energetic connection between all living systems, that's people, that's plants, that's animals, it's all connected. And so our research is focusing on 
understanding that more and uncovering more real empirical scientific understanding of that. And so there are connections happening all the time in groups of people. There are, are what we call local connections. That means in that meeting, you know, with people in the same room, there's a connection going on. The connections go far beyond that. This connection's happening right now between you and I, even though we're in different parts of the world. And there's connections happening with people who are going to listen to this interview at a later time. So the connections aren't even bound by time or space. The connection's happening beyond the boundaries of time and space. And that's going to happen right through this interview. And it happens all the time. And it happens uh, all around the world and beyond our world. So that's where the research really focuses. Now, how do we make that practical? Well, we take it down into understanding things like social coherence. Mm. How can this help a staff at a hospital? Mm. You know, how can this you know, uh, benefit uh, an athletic team? You know, these are the, the ways in which we take something and we build it from what Doc Chaudhary, our founder, calls the term he uses from sky to street. Mm. Sky meaning the, the wide conceptual understandings, the glamorous uh, understandings of we're all connected and time and space doesn't matter and all that. But then you have to bring that down in the name of service so that it makes sense and has an impact on the lives of people who are living their ordinary lives just trying to make sense out of life. Uh, and have a meaningful life and take care of their families and their children and all of that, that's where it needs to land. So we take it from here to here. And that's uh, what I think we've done, you know, been pretty good at. And I mean, the question which, which came up is in a group, I mean, many of us, they have this ability to sense when something is not really coherent and it's, it's sure. not harmonious. But then the question is, how can we change it? <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, it gets into a lot of things. I mean, you know, this is where our, our training programs will focus. What, what biases are we are we seeing the meeting through? You know, what histories from the past are we associating with that meeting? You know, um, we can all learn to put out more love and care in the meeting. You know, and we have a we can all take responsibility for our own self, our own energies. And that is always going to help whatever's going on in that meeting. It doesn't mean that everybody's just going to suddenly become an angel because you do that, but you're taking responsibility and there's an energetic field in that meeting, right? And you can influence that field in a way that can help. You know, people still have choice. The part of the laws of planet earth are free will and choice, you know, so you can set up all kinds of beneficial field environments and people can still choose not to, be in a good place. Yeah. You can go to the most beautiful forest that there is. You know, I think you live in the south of Germany. You can go, you know, to the Bavarian forest and somebody can go in the Bavarian forest and it can just lift their spirits and wow, they just love being in nature. And somebody can be processing something and go into that forest and just complain and gripe. And, you know, their conversation sitting in the, under a beautiful tree could be about somebody else and how they don't like them, you know. So the environment's there that gives us greater opportunity to make choices that are regenerative, but we still have choice. But in a meeting context, we can learn how we can at least set the field environment. So more cooperation does happen. And as cooperation happens, then it opens the door for more intuitive insight, uh, more efficiency, more, you know, all kinds of things happen when we harmonize and begin to work more together. Mm. And I'm also interested in, um, you mentioned it al already, that also more intelligence or more creativity is possible. So, and I mean, I guess we are in a time where really being, or being okay with the situation that we don't know and being open for insights coming where we kind of can really develop something further than we we did already is is really called <laughs> in in every one of us and um what in your experience and in your um, you developing all of that what, what is crucial in that that we are more open for insights creativity and being fine with the unknown well, I think we have to, first of all, recognize, you know, we have to sort of raise our own vibratory rate a little bit, you know, 
And that has a lot to do with heart. You know, when you add heart to something, you, you get a lift. I mean, it just works that way. And the heart is not competitive with other things. You know, I feel like you add more heart to whatever you do in life. It, it, it can just help improve it. So you got to raise your vibratory rate. When our vibratory rate, so to speak, that means our thoughts, our feelings, and our attitudes are down, we're not open to new possibilities. Everything looks the same. Everything looks hopeless. Hopeless. There's no solution to this problem. You know, uh, all of that becomes the reality, right? And people live in that reality. As we learn to raise that vibratory rate a little bit, one of the things that happens is it gives us a bit more feeling of self-security. And within that self-security, then we're a bit more open to new possibilities. You know, new, more hopeful possibilities can begin to emerge. And so it's a tough time right now for that because the world is in a very transitional phase right now. That's this kind way of saying it's, you know, it's crazy out there. <laughs> and so people develop these, these perceptions and attitudes about things, and I understand why they do. But when we make connection with our heart, and with the intelligence associated with heart, and that self-security begins to emerge, then all of a sudden the world can begin to look different. Then we become more open to new possibilities, and as we become more open, a lot of times they begin to show up. An example I use sometimes is that there can be times in life, I've had them, I'm sure you have, and most everyone who's watching your conversation today has, when you're faced with a challenge, you can't figure out the answer. And no matter what, your logical, linear intelligence cannot see a way through it or a hopeful possibility. And what happens then? Very often, that's when people will just say, oh, I don't know what to do. And they begin to go a little deeper within themselves. For some people, it's when they get on their knees and pray. You know, For other people, it's when they meditate. For others, it's when they go outside and they take that walk, you know. Uh, or they get in their car and they drive off into the night. You know, they're looking for answers. And what's happening is they're pulling a little deeper inside themselves. As they do, it, what happens for me, and I think for many people, is that sometimes when you hit a certain place inside where you, you surrender and you recognize you don't have the answers and you're open to whatever new possibility there could be, you become vulnerable like that, the inner dialogue starts to change. It can go from things like the hopelessness and despair to, you know, this is a hard situation and I don't know how I'm going to get through it, but I've been in tough situations before and I got through those and I bet you I get through this one too. That's the lift you see that begins to turn the, into new possibilities, recognizing, yeah, it's tough, but I've been through tough before and I'll get through this. That's a lift in the perception. As it is maintained a little bit, then guess what? Sometimes solutions do show up. Or if a overt solution doesn't show up, we do develop a greater ability to make peace with the situation. Mm -hmm. We make peace with it. And we make a new life for ourselves in the context of that challenge when we begin to find a way to make peace with it. So all that happens inside, and sometimes it happens really fast at high speed, but that's sort of the psychological pathway I've seen myself, and I think I've seen a lot of that in others. Mm -hmm. And then what, in my experience, it can also help if you surround yourself with, with people which you know they, they understand you, they give you compassion, and, and you, you just look for help also, maybe with friends. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. We need the connection. Connection is one of the greatest things like that and having people around us and all that. But unfortunately, there's a lot of lonely people in the world today. Oh, yeah. They don't have people. And that's why I think shows like yours can be helpful and important. There may be people watching our show right now that aren't surrounded by a lot of people that they can have that conversation with. But maybe that, that person who we're speaking to right now can get a lift out of this and recognize they're not alone. You know, there's a whole world of people out there and there's some wonderful people all around the world. You can make connections you know, mm -hmm. in certain ways with others mm -hmm. because, you know, the loneliness this is a big deal. So finding people you can talk to and having someone you can resonate with or other or more than one, but people around you is an important thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do a lot of interviews. Uh, and I also still do live events and people still show up at live events. Now, Nobody needs to come to a live event to see me and hear what I have to say. 
<laughs> you can do it all from their computer, but yet they still show up. Why is that? You know, it's different. <laughs> they want the connection. You know, they want the connection with each other and maybe with me. I'm just saying that they want to feel that they're, you know, they're in an environment with other like-minded people who are also uh, exploring. They want to feel that feeling. Yeah, and so that's why I think both types of mediums still have relevance uh, yes. because people want that connection. Yeah. Yes, it's a it's a certain kind of nourishment you get there. Yeah. It's yeah, well, it was a great analogy. You know, back many years ago when uh, videos came out, you know, the video business, you know, everybody was convinced that when the videos came out, that it was going to destroy the movie industry. Nobody was going to go to a movie theater anymore. They were all going to watch movies at home. Now, certainly, we watch lots of movies at home, <laughs> uh, but we still sometimes go to the movie theater. Why is that? We want that experience. We want to go down there and go into the theater and get some popcorn and you know, be in the big screen and the big sound system and all that. Now, probably uh, ninety percent of the movies I watch are watched at home, mm -hmm. but I still go to the movie theater sometimes. So it didn't kill the movie business. You know, the movie business still was relevant, the theater business, because people want that experience. Mm -hmm. So they want the experience of connection. We can't do it all online. We can't do it all just staying in our house. We have to get out into the world and connect. And that's happening. Yeah. And when I listen to you, what pops up again and again is um, self-responsibility. Yeah. You know, we live in an interesting era. I sometimes characterize it this way. I say we're living in an era of heightened co-creativity fueled by self-empowered efforts. Mm. I Meaning we have to do it but we're in a very co-creative time where we're creating and reshaping our lives and, and rewriting the future for ourselves and the world. But we still have to step up and do it. There's no way around it. Um, there's been plenty of help, plenty of facilitation. You know, there's plenty out there you know, that people have access to. Um, but it comes down to what we do in moment to moment, day to day. And, and there again, you can't just read the next book or go to the next uh, summit or any of that and expect that's going to do it for you. You can be inspired by these things and that's why we're doing what we're doing today. But at the end of the day, it's about whether we can just go ahead and make a little shift in ourselves, you know, and that starts from just shifting attitudes and perceptions about things. Yeah. You know? and, and becoming that what we want to be. And there I, I kind of also want to go, what in your uh, experience, what is the relevance of, let's say kind of going into the future and in, envision certain possibilities. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there can certainly be, that's good. And I think, you know, putting ourselves out there, um, the way I look at it is that, you know, this is a, I'll widen the subject a little bit and then I'll bring it back. Uh, you know, we live in a holographic universe in a sense. There's all kind of holographic potentials out there for us that are available. Uh, what we draw to us has a lot to do with what we're putting out, you know, and if we're putting out something that's, uh, that's good, we're going to draw back that. It's a simple thing. It's not just the old law of attraction stuff, but it really is a holographic understanding of that. And so having a vision, having hopes, having dreams, putting those out there can be real important because it shows that there's an expansion. Now, I think one of the secrets to that is not looking at it, through the lens of it has to be exactly that way for it to have been effective. And here's why the most fulfilling experiences I've ever had in my life were ones I was never expecting. Mm, that's a good point. I like that. You know, it's like a quick story and I'll be, I won't belabor this one, but you know, I'm here on your show today in part because I became a best selling author. <laughs> that was an accident. <laughs> 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 you know, years ago, I was a uh, heart math had its own publishing company. We don't have that now, but, but I ran that publishing company and but there were a lot of media articles in the early days on heart math and they were all cool. But one in particular, and I don't know why today just piqued the interest of the publishing industry. And they started to call up the big publishers, the editors from the big publisher started calling There's a bunch of them called all within like a week, you know, wanted to know where we want to do a book. And I was running the publishing company. So I told them, well, we publish our own books, but I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say. So I started having the meetings with them, going to New York and having the meetings and all that. And they would say, well, we really want to do a book. Uh, 
who's the author? And I'd say, Doc Shortry. And he'd go, oh, that's great. You know, I said, but Doc's a private man. He doesn't do media interviews. He's not going to do a book tour and all that. And they go, well, that's a real problem. And then in a couple of cases, they said, well, you know, you act like you know what you're talking about. You ever thought about writing a book? And I went, no, I haven't. And he said, well, you ought to think about it. I went back and told Doc, he says, yeah, why don't we write it together? <laughs> <laughs> and here I am. But see, the point of the story is that I wasn't saying, I want to be an author. You know, I want to write a book. You know, now it's nothing wrong with having that vision for those that are listening. But that wasn't my vision. My vision was like, how can I be a better man? How can I help the heart math business grow? How can we get more heart out to the world? I mean, this is the vision for me, right? And that vision turned around and gave me a great gift, you know. Yeah, and in a way, Howard, when I listened to that, it, your vision was really very, very big, and there came a really specific detail yeah. in it. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was fortunate. And but here's the thing: it's like there's so many ways that we can serve. It doesn't have to be through speaking and authoring books. I mean, a lot of people see that's that's that would be the thing that they would need to do. But I see service happening all the time. I see amazing people doing amazing things that nobody will ever know about necessarily. But their lives are great. But, you know, there's so many wonderful people doing extraordinary things for others in the world today. And those are my heroes. I mean, the mother, the single mother with three kids having to work two jobs and doing it with a smile on her face becomes my hero. Yeah. That's my hero. Yeah. So she will never write a book, you know. Uh, but yet, you know, she's lifting the spirits of others and life is going to reward that person in some way appropriate for her. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so it's about that. So yeah, the visions are important though. And I think people need to expand their, their dreams. They need to move beyond their self-limiting beliefs. We put boxes around ourselves. I can never do this. I can never do that. Uh, I'm not good enough. All those things. And that is not necessary. So one of the things that I often talk about, usually at the end of my live shows, is I will say to people, if you don't remember anything else, and I'll say this to the audience now, here, if you don't remember anything else, I'd like you to remember this. Please, please have compassion for yourself. Yeah. Recognize you're a good person doing the very best you can in a really interesting and challenging time in the history of humankind. So if life gets tough and you feel like you're not good enough and all that, just have that little talk with your own heart and give yourself the gift of self-compassion. Yeah. You deserve it. There is a sentence I repeat and repeat again is, I am enough. There you I go. am I'm enough. enough. That's so soothing. That's right. Yeah, so that's a give it. I hope people can hear that today you know, watching our program. Um, you know, be kind to yourself. You know, Give yourself a little you know, compassion there. Uh, don't be so hard on yourself. And don't box yourself in with you know, all the things that you think can't happen or can't be. At least uh, have an attitude of you don't know. You know, uh, in art math, we call that being neutral. Neutral is just this place where you you don't have to decide anything. You know, it's not it's not a just a dull state. It's actually a highly aware state that's not yet deciding something. You know, it's just being neutral and open to see about new possibilities and where things might go. Yeah, when the pendulum of something is just in the middle. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's exactly right. Well said. Good analogy. It's like right in the middle. You just sort of hang in there. You know, you see what life shows up with. But yeah, and often being able to stay there for a while when not really an authentic impulse is coming, that's really crucial because this can really build up the momentum where it goes in the right direction. That's right. Exactly right. And, uh, you know, just, we're going to have, uh, you know, different perceptions all the time based upon what we've learned in life. And so uh, the term we use at HeartMath for those is called histories. Histories can be useful in that they, you know, certain things I don't need to repeat. I understand that this is probably not the best way to do X, Y, and Z, right? But at the same time, histories can get in the way. Mm -hmm. They create thinking that we know exactly um, uh, how something's going to be, or we know exactly how someone is, or how they're going to behave, or uh, whether this is going to work, or that's not going to work, you know. And those histories can, and again, they can provide some good guidance, but they can also be limiting beliefs that don't allow for new possibilities to emerge. Mm. 
Hmm. So trying to eliminate some of those and keep the thoughts and the feelings, especially the emotions, keep all of that as much as you can going on the upside, hmm. you know, um, that's important. And that will magnetize uh, more fulfillment to us mm -hmm. and fulfillment's different for everybody. And so whatever fulfillment is for you or for me or for the folks that are listening today, it's individual. But as you keep those regenerative emotions at the forefront of what's happening inside you, it will help to magnetize more of that fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And my experiences when I was really in, let's say, really dark, heavy, dense periods, I needed to look out for the tiny, tiny, tiny little goodness in something because right. everything felt really heavy and, and hopeless. And, but when you, when you make yourself really open and sensitive and, and check, maybe I can find just a little tiny thing of goodness that can already lead you in another direction. That's right. There's always something there that we can find. And at HeartMath, some of our people have worked with some very challenged populations, you know, uh, people that are really struggling and they're at the bottom of the, you know, society in many ways. And, uh, people that have been traumatized, you know, people that have been, you know, through lots of stuff that I, you know, I never have to go through can imagine. And in working with those people, they, they find that it can be difficult at times, but they can often find something inside them or those people can find something inside themselves about life that they can appreciate yeah. that glimmer. And that begins to be something that they can, can work with. Um, great story of a teacher uh, who, used heart math living in the inner city in New York, working with the very, you know, impoverished children trying to help this one child. And he lived in a, a home environment that was terrible. His parents were drug addicted and all that. And he had, no, you know, it was a tough situation and she kept trying to get him to appreciate something and he couldn't. And one day they were walking down the street and, and there was just one wild rose growing on this fence, you know, Uh, and she stopped and she said, let's take a look at this. And she began to point out the rose and, and the colors of the rose and the petals of the rose and how it was shaped and all that. And as she did, he began to like really study this rose and he began to appreciate the rose. And she took that feeling and she worked with this kid and she really helped him a lot to open his heart more mm. and to sort of move beyond his, his challenges uh, in, mm. in a way that was helpful. But it had to start somewhere. And it was just her being observant enough walking down the street in, in this bad neighborhood to notice a rose. You know, yeah, and help the kids. So, I have another question. Um, sometimes I notice that I'm when I'm on my own, I can really be in this kind of uplifted emotional vibration. But when I come then in a group of people or in a big city where the where it's more you know more down and more let's say negative and heavy, it's sometimes really difficult to, to stay then in my higher vibration. And what can you recommend? I mean, it would be lovely to, to stay more in this and help others to uplift and rather be then from the group kind of suck in something else. Well, the more coherent you are, the more hearts you put out, the less the environment you're in affects you. Now that's, it's obvious that you know, when we go into these places, we're going to, there's going to be an effect. You know, I travel a lot. I'm, I go into big cities, dense populations. You know, I've got some of that coming up really soon. I'm going to be like in a big city for a week, right? Well, that's going to have an effect on me in some way. I just have to be aware of it and recognize that I want to offset that effect as much as I can. Mm -hmm. And to do that, I just need to practice what I know a little even, even more, you know, and make sure that I'm being conscious of what I'm feeling and recognizing that there's going to be a difference feeling associated with me being in that big city versus where I live here in Northern California in this beautiful forest of redwood trees. Um, yeah. There's going to be a difference, right? And so I just recognize that and it'll make a big deal out of it. I just say, okay, you know, people, are, everybody's sensitive to the energetics and the field environment they're in. Uh, it goes back to the theme, one of our themes in our program today, which is self-responsibility. Whatever that field environment is, I'm still responsible for how I interact with that field environment. And so I put out more love. You know, if, I, if I'm going to an airport and on an airplane, I can just sit there and casually radiate love, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to the people around me and to the people in that airplane. 
you know, it doesn't have to be this big gushy thing where I'm just loving everybody and want to hug them all, but just a feeling, an energetic radiation of love. Mm. Well, it probably helps the airplane, but if nothing else, it certainly helps me. Mm. Yeah. And then, yeah, I guess when you are in a more challenging environment, environment, it also comes back to more self-care. That's right. More self-care. You know, there's things I do when I travel. I mean, I'm watching my diet really closely. I'm doing, you know, certain things that I know to do that I really need to do for that self-care to provide that stability, you know, um, that I need in the context of that. Uh, so I look for where I'm, I'm gaining energy and where I'm losing it. Yeah. yeah. It becomes a, an energy efficiency game for me. So where am I, you know, gaining and where am I losing and how do I minimize the losses here so I can remain resilient while I'm out there because I go into other countries and when you're in another country, there's a great lift of being in that, the other culture and the adventure of that. But it's also different, you know, I mean, in your hotel room, sometimes like cutting a light on can be different. You don't know where the light thing is, you know, or whatever, or you can't, you know, tell how hot or cold the shower is supposed to be. You know, you can't, you know, there's all these little things like that that go on all the time. And there I am, you know, as a speaker supposed to put out all this love and care to large groups of people. Well, I got to have my act together to do that. So I can't let those little things bother me as much. And I just need to learn to, to find a flow with it and, and minimize energy drains mm -hmm. uh, so that when it's time for me to be with those people and go up on that stage that I've got something to give them because they paid money to come there and see me. And I have a responsibility to those people to give them the very best I can give them. Mm, yeah and then in a way when we have this ch more challenging situation i also noticed that it builds up even more capacity i had a situation in the beginning of the year i was in india and i met my daughter there <coughs> and booked the room in the advance and this place was the area was very full because there was uh, some big event happening and we entered the room it was evening and the room it was so dirty <laughs> you saw that it wasn't clean for for months i yeah. don't know how many people slept in this bed before it had yeah. mosquitoes in the room and i was in the bed and i i mean i could i could have argued the whole night with the smell with the dirt with the mosquitoes with everything and then i decided all right that's a good place to start to practice <laughs> that's right And then leave, and then get another room. Yeah, <laughs> if you make pace with that one, at least go get another one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a good story. Yeah, we only have a little bit more time, I think, today. Um, yes. What else would you like to talk about? Let's let's just um, see maybe what what um, are you most passionate about to use the last minutes to share okay. with our audience. What's most passionate about for me is I see a movement happening in the world today where more of the qualities of the heart are being added, you know, whether they call it a heart or not, it's, it's the extra uh, cooperation, the kindness, the innovation, the new insights people are getting and how that's manifesting across the world. Now, surely there's a huge amount of problems. There's wars, there's political upheaval, there's poverty, there's just lots of stuff, but there's a stronger momentum happening and I call it the ad heart movement. Wow. The ad heart movement is actually happening in the world and I'm doing everything I can to facilitate that movement. Mm -hmm. And that's what's most impassionate for me. If people are interested in knowing more about that uh, or participating in it, go to the heartmath.com website and become an ad heart facilitator. I got a program that helps people become an ad heart facilitator to contribute to the ad heart movement. And I developed it last year just for that. So it's not super expensive. It doesn't take long to do. It's done online. It's six, six little audio recordings you listen to. And you learn basic heart math. You learn about our technology. You get the technology in the program. And then you learn about how to share that, both personally and professionally. I call it formal and informal sharing. You know, informal sharing is how we walk in the world. You know, how do we treat that person in the store? You know, Uh, how do we treat a coworker? Um, formal sharing is if you're a professional and you, let's say you're a psychologist, how would you start your psychology session using a heart math technique? If you're a yoga teacher, how could you integrate this into your yoga class? You know, so a lot of it's about sharing. So the, the energetic theme of the program is to learn, to practice and to share. 
So it's putting the heart out. It's taking heart math and making it easier for people to, uh, to learn it uh, and simpler. And they can go to other certifications too, but um, and later, but this is a way that I help, trying to help structure a little bit to add heart to the ad heart movement. It's gonna happen anyhow. It's much bigger than me, much bigger than heart math. It's part of the evolution of our times and it's happening. And so and it's you much can add it everywhere. I mean, it's needed yeah. everywhere. You can apply right. it in every area and every profession. And maybe if people are listening to that and bringing that more into their life, maybe it even can change their profession and career. It sure can. So just go to heartmath.com and check out Ad Heart Facilitator. And there's other things. You don't have to do that. I'm just saying that's a suggestion. And the, the, the thing that, again, that I'm passionate about is watching this world change and watching a new world birth itself right in the midst of the old one. And within that new world, there's a new association to heart, not the old association, but to the new heart, the evolving heart, the one that shows itself to be highly intelligent, intuitive, uh, connecting, all those things uh, are associated with heart. And it's, it's evolving just like everything else is. And so... I agree with you. Adding heart never hurts uh, to whatever we're trying to do, whether it's lunch <laughs> later on today. Adding heart to it is never going to hurt a thing. You know, it can certainly add a lot. Wow. I feel so nourished with our conversation and I really can feel how it gives me hope and joy. And I also connect to this movement. Of course, the, the reason why I set up the summit is, is also that. And, uh, Thank you for taking this time for sharing your knowledge, your wisdom with us. Paul. Well, sure. My pleasure. And thank you for having a summit like this for everybody listening. These things take time, energy, work, and vision. And you've done that. I want to appreciate you for doing that and for inviting me to be a part of it. I hope that you know people gain something of value and uh, we all go out and add some more heart to the world today. Yeah. And all the best to you, to your, your organization. Thank you so much. My pleasure. You take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. Be well. Bye.